a young woman would finally save up the money to fly across continents to meet her online boyfriend. 22 minutes after leaving the airport she would be murdered and her body burned to hide their relationship from his fiancé, a fiancé she never knew he had. On December 30, 2016, a local hunter was out walking his dog along the road in Jaluva, in Belgium's West Flanders province. During this walk, his dog came across a burnt corpse overgrown with blackberry bushes lying in a ditch off the road. He simply dismissed it as an animal carcass and went home. He would spend the entire night second-guessing himself on whether it really was an animal or a human body and decided to call the police first thing on the morning of December 31st. When the police arrived they saw rats eating away at the carcass which they had to shoo away. Immediately identified the body as human, but it was nearly unrecognizable. The torso was severely burnt and the face unrecognizable, while the hands and feet were mostly intact. The feet being preserved was fortunate as the victim had very distinctive nail polish and a design on her toenails which police believe someone would remember applying and to whom. As for the victim itself, the police concluded on the scene that it was likely a murder due to the burns and how she had barely any clothing on her. The police also couldn't find any lighters or white spirit slash petroleum so this led them to discount that the scene before them was the result of self-immolation. Other than that, all they could tell was that she was a woman and based on the state of decomposition, she had likely been killed some time ago. As for the killer, based on the location the police thought it likely that the killer must have been a local who knew the area well as the body was found in a secluded enough area. Lastly, the police did not receive any missing person reports so they had no guesses on who the victim was. When the police removed the body and brought it to the morgue where the morgue. The autopsy began on January 2, 2017, and the medical examiner noted numerous fractures on the woman's face, one on the skull and another near the eye socket. Her height was placed at 1.44 meters tall, and she was said to be young, placed between the ages of 18 to 25. She also had a very pronounced overbite. She was not carrying any identification or a handbag or a purse, only a necklace it seemed. All they did find was a burnt piece of black plastic which was likely the remains of a container she was placed into when her body was burnt. Based on the shape of her skull the coroner also determined that their Jane Doe was of Asian descent. The police's very first idea was that the victim could have been Narumi Kurosaki, a Japanese student who went missing from France on December 5th. The police reasoned that her killer could have transported her body across the border and into Belgium to make it harder to link the body to her and it to the killer. Narumi was ruled out very quickly, however. When it came to her burnt torso, there was a piece of fabric picked from the charred remains and when closely examined it was a label from a t-shirt and the brand was Masakino who only operated out of Asia. She also wore a unique watch manufactured in Japan with only 1,300 copies ever produced and each sold only in Japan. Alongside the clothing tag this indicated that rather than being a local with Asian ancestry, she likely hailed from Asia itself either as a tourist, student, or a recent immigrant. With this in mind, the police reached out to all the Asian embassies in Belgium but none had reported any of their nationals missing. They then questioned employees at the local immigration offices and refugee centers but they too couldn't be of much help. The police took this to mean that she had yet to be reported missing or had limited contact with her family. The police proceeded to conduct door-to-door -door searches and asked the locals if they recognized or knew the woman but Jaluva was a small and rural community so none of the locals had seen any Asian women. They then went to all nearby beauty and nail salons and showed them the decedent's nail polish but nobody recognized it or remembered applying it. Many large-scale mushroom farms nearby were also known to employ a large number of Asian immigrant workers so the police visited them and asked if any workers failed to show up to work. All were accounted for rendering it another dead end. Police also hit the streets to question local sex workers, another industry many Asian immigrants took part in but also returned empty-handed. Lastly, they visited many Asian-themed restaurants such as Thai or Chinese restaurants but again, no employees were missing. Lastly, they ran her DNA but they had no leads to compare it to and Belgium didn't have its own DNA database so the samples were sent to the databases of other neighboring countries but also to no success. 
While the police were chasing these leads in vain, forensic examiners were still sifting through the remains of the charred portion of the body to try and find anything else. Under the body, they found bundles of burned newspapers all of which were soaked in white spirit alcohol. Some of the newspapers survived and could still be read. This proved to be most helpful out of all of them because from what remained, police could read the headline, identify the newspaper as a Dutch publication named Metro, and that the article was printed on November 21, 2016. Therefore, their Jane Doe likely met her end sometime on November 21 or soon after. This was confirmed even further when police analyzed the larvae and maggots on the body which corroborated what the newspaper led them to suspect, that the time of death was approximately November 20th to November 21st. Despite this lead, it did nothing to help identify her so by February 7, 2017, once the police finished crafting their facial reconstruction, they published notices to the public all across Belgium. They asked if anyone recognized her face, all of her belongings, the nail polish and if anybody saw something unusual and suspicious on November 20th to November 21st, 2016. This seemed to pay off as not long later, a local of Jelova came forward. He told police that he remembered seeing a man out for a jog with his Asian girlfriend by his side. The man he mentioned was a local, knew the area well and even installed a bunch of security cameras outside his house but none inside. One of his hobbies was burning wood. He wasn't in a relationship after his previous partner left him and by all accounts he seemed to have a strong fetish and preference for Asian women as he would exclusively seek only them out on dating websites. His Thai girlfriend and her daughter moved to Belgium with them. No one had seen them since and he himself wasn't even in the country anymore having seemingly fled to Thailand. The number of red flags was numerous. A judge thought so too as the police soon made entry into his home. They ransacked his home and checked the drains of his sink in case any traces of blood or DNA remained. Despite their best efforts, there seemed to be no signs of any criminal activity or cleaning agents were detected either so the murder likely happened elsewhere. For now, the Belgian police could only inform their Thai counterparts and simply wait. It didn't take long for them to hear back. The Thai police had found the man, and his girlfriend, and her daughter both alive and well and all having a fun and enjoyable vacation. He had simply had a bunch of odd behaviors which would coincidentally implicate him and a very poorly timed vacation. They also briefly investigated a man from Menin who was said to have a Nepalese girlfriend that hadn't been seen in a while but she was also ruled out as being the decedent. Now that he was cleared, the police lost their only lead and thus were back to square one. The police would once again reissue the notices on May 2nd, 2018, but nobody came forward at that time. This murder grew into a cold case and their murder victim would seemingly remain a Jane Doe for the foreseeable future. On August 13th, 2018, the Vietnamese embassy contacted the police in Belgium's capital, Brussels. They called after receiving a letter from a man back in Vietnam. He said that he hadn't been in contact with his daughter. 28-year-old Nguyen Tixian since November 21, 2016. Nguyen was born into a modest family of six children, and out of all her siblings, Nguyen was the most successful and academically gifted so her parents focused most of their efforts on her. They invested heavily in her education, even taking up several loans to fund her further education. Eventually, enough money was accumulated for them to fund a trip to Nagoya, Japan for her to study abroad. When in Japan she studied management and accounting, then interior design, and finally bioengineering but managing her studies was difficult on account of just how much more expensive living in Japan was than living in Vietnam. She had to take several jobs such as housekeeper at a hotel, waitress at a restaurant, and working at a supermarket. She also routinely needed to ask for money to be transferred to her from her parents, money she was expected to pay back. Eventually, she found her way to an agency that supports the Vietnamese diaspora in Japan, and she thought it could help her with juggling her job, financial situation, and studies. At the same time, she also met a man from Belgium who happened to be in Japan and the two hit it off, even continuing to talk after he left Japan for Belgium. Her parents, when told, did not approve of this relationship and wanted her to find a boyfriend. Closer to home. 
After her disappearance, the Vietnamese police did not conduct a particularly exhaustive investigation into her case. Once they heard about this mystery, Belgian man, they concluded that she willingly left the country without even verifying that to be so and ended their investigation right then and there. They also added that even if she didn't leave for Belgium, she was still in Japan so there would at the end of the day still be nothing they could do. Nguyen's father was left trying to investigate and search for his missing daughter on his own, even posting up ads and notices all over Facebook, including the Vietnamese communities in Japan and Belgium but went two years without any leads. He exhausted every lead he could while searching in his native Vietnam but then he remembered that she had met a Belgian man while studying in Japan and that back in Vietnam she would regularly speak with a Belgian man online so now desperate for any information, decided to contact the Vietnamese embassy in Brussels on the off chance they could compel the local police to check if she was in the country. The embassy was informed of the body found in Jeluva which then informed the Vietnamese police. They took DNA samples from Nguyen's family. They also gave the police a mobile phone that Nguyen had returned to Vietnam. The phone and samples were placed in a sealed diplomatic suitcase and put on a plane from Vietnam to Belgium. By then, Belgium still didn't have a DNA database and according to one source, this was the first time in Belgian history that DNA samples from a missing person were used to solve a case. And solve the case they did as the samples from Nguyen's family matched the Jaluva Jane Doe. Now that they identified their victim, it was time to identify her killer. It was quick thinking on the part of Nguyen's father to send the phone over to Belgium. They went through the contents and found a conversation she had with her parents. She showed pictures of her Belgian boyfriend and in some of them. Text messages were also pulled from her phone and they were written by a man in Belgium pressuring her to fly to the country in the weeks leading up to Nguyen's murder. The pressure even extended beyond just Nguyen since her father received a text from a Belgian number saying, let your daughter come to Belgium, the tickets have already been paid for. I will take good care of her, it would be a waste of money. The man's passport, an identity card could also be seen. Just one problem. The man's name was supposedly John Rosius. However, the identity card spelt the name with two SS instead of one. An inconsistency. The card numbers on the passport were also fake. The only thing that matched was the photo. Nguyen had given a friend some contact details for those she knew including a Belgian phone number. The police called the number, and it was still in service. The only problem was that it wasn't a personal cell phone number but the number was to a company in Menon with 444 individuals in its employ. The police obtained a list of all their employees and systematically went through each and every one of them. Eventually, they landed on 29-year-old John Vanderleek and he looked exactly the same as the man on Wen's phone and the passport photo. John had a girlfriend he met in 2009 and moved in with her in 2013. Their infant son was born on October 27, 2016. He was born in 1989, in Zanabik and studied to become an electrician, but he didn't finish his studies. It turned out that he didn't need to finish since he still got a well-paying job, one that also required him to travel a lot to Mexico, Italy, Bulgaria and most importantly Asia, especially Japan. Although he got verbally aggressive, from time to time, John was described by his girlfriend as a nice kind man. There was only one incident where he slapped her cheek but he stopped after she threatened to leave should he ever do it again. In the days following, John seemed genuinely apologetic over that incident. John would often use his phone almost every time she saw him, but she always assumed he was speaking with clients. She said he was reserved and modest and never once worried about any infidelity during his trips abroad. Little did she know, John had traveled to Japan in May 2016 and met Nguyen via a dating site they both had normal conversations about their interest at first before they soon turned into conversations of a sexual nature. In fact there were many text messages from John asking if they could have sex. In no time they both met at a hotel for a date, and later both had consensual sex. On November 8, 2018, the police decided that it was time to arrest John. They knew he went to work early in the morning so just outside his home but far enough for his family not to witness it, they set up a fake DUI checkpoint. They had John step out of his vehicle and he was led into the back of a police van where they said their equipment and breathalyzer tests were located. 
Once inside the doors were closed behind him as officers handcuffed him and placed him under arrest for the premeditated murder of Nguyen Tixian. The arrest came only a few days before the wedding and only a day before arrangements were due to be finished. Zhang's reaction to the arrest was one of indifference. He was described as flat and didn't seem terribly surprised. Their plan to shield his girlfriend from having to witness John's arrest was so effective that it had the opposite effect. She grew worried when John didn't call to let him know he arrived safely and when the police showed up at her home to conduct a search, she noticed one of the officers holding a folder that said, premeditated murder. And as she never even heard of Nguyen, she could only assume that John had been murdered and she was inconsolable. Informing her that he was the suspect instead of the victim could hardly be called reassuring. At first, John denied any involvement and only admitted to knowing of Nguyen. The detectives nevertheless continued their interrogations and after two and a half hours, he confessed and admitted that Nguyen's other cell phone and her tablet were buried underneath his bathtub, being placed there just before it was installed. To retrieve them the police had to use high-grade tools to cut into a bathroom and slide a small camera through the incision to try and look around for the devices since the tub was built against the side of the wall space behind it for maintenance. They quickly found the phone and tablet hidden in a corner in a corner. Across both devices, over 9,000 messages sexually charged messages were written and exchanged between Gwyn and John with John even speaking in this way to her while his son was being born. John also lied about his name and address to Nguyen so that she wouldn't look him up and see photos of his girlfriend and child on his Facebook. John did not think this act of deception would last though and that soon enough Nguyen was likely to find out about his real identity and real life which would ruin his marriage. John believed that in order to preserve his reputation and family he had to lure Nguyen to Belgium and kill her. This was when John began relentlessly and constantly pressuring Gwyn to take a break from her studies and come visit him in Belgium sending 139 text messages to that effect. Little did she know, the purpose of this trip was just so John could kill her to cover up his affair. Every time that Gwyn hesitated and expressed reluctance, John would always bring up having children with her which was something she had really wanted to do with him. John didn't think this plan was worth spending his own money on though so he forced Nguyen to pay for everything. This resulted in her having to take several loans just to fund her trip to Belgium. She first landed in Helsinki, Finland and got a connecting flight to Amsterdam, Netherlands before lastly paying for a ticket and boarding a train to Kortrijk, Belgium where she had no accommodations or hotel waiting for her. After her train arrived she was expecting John to be ready to pick her up. Instead, John despite being free took his time and decided to stay home. By the time he finally bothered to show up, Nguyen was very unhappy with how long she was made to wait in a foreign country she had never stepped foot in. Once they got inside his car, John saw Nguyen on his phone which she snatched away. This led to an argument before John finally explained that she couldn't stay or take any pictures and videos of her trip to Belgium because of his girlfriend and son. Needlessly to say, Nguyen was very betrayed to hear this and slapped John and threatened to expose the affair. John in response did what he was always planning on doing, just earlier than intended. He started beating on her specifically the face resulting in many fractures to her facial features. Eventually, Nguyen was beaten to the point of unconsciousness. John then drove off the paved road to somewhere more secluded ending up in Lettigen. Once there he stopped the car and covered Nguyen's mouth, and nose with his hand for around 43 seconds until she succumbed to suffocation. By them, Nguyen had only been in Belgium for 22 minutes. He then drove back to his home with Nguyen's body still in his car where he just had to hope his girlfriend wasn't home. She was home but still didn't notice because the blinds were pulled and she was watching TV. He retrieved a plastic barrel, white spirit and some matches from the shed, loaded them up in the car and drove to Jaluva. Once there, he placed the body in the barrel, covered it in plastic, poured white spirit all over and used the matches to set some newspapers on fire which he used to ignite the white spirit. John didn't stick around and left as soon as the fire was let. John then drove to a nearby canal where he threw one's handbags and backpack into the canal where they were washed away never to be recovered. John finally returned home by 9 p.m. having been out for three hours. 
John cleaned up all the blood in the car before going inside and once inside he washed his clothes and shredded Nguyen's ID card which was swiftly thrown into a dumpster afterward. He held onto her wallet which he threw away when he went in for his shift the next morning. Only a few days later, John took this statement back and claimed that it was just an accident, an accident that he blamed his girlfriend for. He said that he wanted to cheat on her because she didn't pleasure him orally often enough for his liking. His logic was that if she fulfilled his sexual needs more often, then he wouldn't have cheated on her. If he never cheated then he would have never met Nguyen and if he never met Nguyen then he wouldn't have killed her, therefore she should share some of the blame. This was said to be the final straw for her. She had visited him in prison three separate times trying to be supportive, seek an answer for why or maybe even prove his innocence. Hearing him say this motivated her to finally give up on John and completely cut him off. John's trial began on January 8, 2021. Before the Assizes Court of West Flanders and for the prosecutor prosecuting John, it was in fact his first case. On the first day of the trial, prosecutors sought to discount the insanity defense before it could even be raised. They submitted psychiatric reports showing John knew what he was doing was wrong and that he wasn't a psychopath, he had a conscience that he actively ignored to carry out the murder. John expressed remorse during the trial but it appears that few believed him. John denied any premeditation, he said. I'm actually a sweet boy. And said that he brought her to Belgium so she could have a better future and better work opportunities. He also wanted to show her around his home. The judge was incredulous and asked if he really risked everything just to show his mistress the local tourist traps. The prosecutor countered this by telling the court that John advised Nguyen not to purchase a return ticket. He eventually admitted that she brought her over for the sex. Since it was hard to make any argument as to John's innocence, his lawyer simply suggested a conditioned sentence slash probation. John was asked about his comments in police custody when he blamed his wife for not pleasuring him orally. He in court completely retracted that statement and said, Of course my wife isn't to blame. The issue for the jury to deliberate was whether or not John acted with premeditation. On January 14th, the jury returned a guilty verdict but they ultimately decided that the murder was not premeditated. Although they admit that he did lure him to Belgium, they considered the murder itself too haphazard and sudden to have been planned. Furthermore, how reckless John was when rushing from place to place to gather the tools to dispose of her body with Nguyen still in the car meaning anyone could have walked by, looked inside and seen her body showed that he didn't seem to know what he was doing. It appeared heavily improvised and it was only mere luck that nobody reported the fire leaving the body to remain undiscovered for a month. On January 15, 2021, John Van Der Leeg was sentenced to 27 years imprisonment, one year less than what the prosecution had been asking for. He will be eligible for parole by November 2027, at the earliest. Many in Belgium were satisfied with the sentence but Nguyen's family in Vietnam, not so much and were in fact shocked by the sentence. Apparently, John's conviction was how they learned that capital punishment was not universal. They had been expecting the death penalty since their native Vietnam had it on the books so they just assumed it must be the same over in Belgium. After the conviction, John's ex-girlfriend was asked about Nguyen to which she revealed that she held no blame or animosity toward her. She said that because Nguyen didn't know about her, she was an innocent and blameless victim and that it would be pointless to hate her for dating her partner. Her exact words were, I don't feel any resentment towards that woman. I feel compassion above all. She believed his lies, she didn't know any better.